What can a Spanish silver coin and a six-sided bone die tell us about the American Revolution? Stick around to find out on Artifactually Speaking. Hello and welcome to Artifactually Speaking. I'm Brad Hafford, archaeologist and specialist in the ancient world. And I'm Tom Pedrick, historian and specialist in modern Europe. So Tom, today we're going to look at yet another couple of objects that are going to lead us down history lane, I suppose, if you want to call it that. We have started this series in order to look at what I think are kind of mundane objects, but that give us real insight into the ancient past, but not so ancient, really. As an archaeologist, of course, I deal with ancient artifacts in my daily work at a museum and in the field. But as a historian, I think you're mostly looking at texts, but also some modern objects, right? Yeah, from time to time, I get to visit a museum and put everything I've seen into context. It's just a great mental exercise. Right, and even some objects that we might have in our house have great stories, and they don't have to be all that old to have that, and they can reflect on the time period they were made and even reused because objects have long lives, at least some of them do, and we can learn about those by asking questions of objects. That's true, and as we've been discovering, the artifactualist has some pretty specific questions that can shed light on these objects. Exactly, and I think that is kind of what we're defining, something that we would call artifactualist. But we're kind of acting like journalists in a way and asking questions about artifacts, modern artifacts, really, relatively modern, the past couple of hundred years maybe. And like a journalist, we ask these questions, but we've changed them a little. The journalists start with who, because they're asking questions usually of people, we're asking questions of objects that can't really speak, but we can learn about. So we start with what? A what could be many different answers, though. It is perhaps an obvious answer, what is this, and we have one answer, but other people might see something else in it, and it may have been reused for something else. Where was it used? Where was it found? You can go on and on with these questions, which exactly. is what's so interesting about them. Yep. and. We want to try to end up on the who if we can. Sometimes we can draw conclusions about the type of person who would have used it. Yeah, and I think that's part of the fun for ones that are even older, say 19th century, and it's really hard to know who this person was. I can still get a, something in my imagination, a, a picture, a better picture of the sort of person that might have held this thing or used it. I, that's what we're doing in this series, and in this particular series, we are going pretty far back in time. Uh, somewhere around 250 years back. And that's going to lead us to our first artifact. That is the stamp of authenticity. Exactly, and this is a stamped coin in a way. Exactly. It has been stamped with a screw press. So the what question is that it is a, an eight real coin. And we'll look there at the front where we can see Charles III, who was king of Spain. And it tells us the win right on it. This is one of the few times that we've got an exact. It was struck in 1787. On the back of the coin, we see the Spanish coat of arms and two pillars that are wrapped with banners of sorts. So earlier versions of this were sometimes called the pillar dollar. But this one is known as the milled dollar because it has been milled. It's a perfect circle, a little bit battered now, and they circulated as far as the Far East. I'm going to switch to uh, a close-up camera now to show the actual object. Here it is, and we can see the name of Charles III there, Dei Gratia, which means by the grace of God, 1787, and the back that shows Hispan et end Rex, so he is king of Spain and the Indies. So the Caribbean was a sort of highway to send silver back from the New World. The Spanish were 
taking a lot of silver from the New World and sending it back to Spain. They became one of the richest countries. Oddly enough, though, it affected their economy in maybe an unexpected way at the time. That was, they increased their money supply, and that meant inflation. So it felt a little strange, perhaps, for them to have no, so much money and yet be able to seemingly purchase less with it. So we've answered the what in many ways. What is pretty big, though. It's a coin, but it's also an example of what we could call the first global currency. We've answered the when when it was struck, but it was used for a very long time. And you may have noticed that there were small marks on there that are called chop marks. And that indicates that it also circulated in the Far East, in China, where they would test the coin to make sure that it was genuine. Because there were so many of these and they were so valuable, people often counterfeited them. So we've also got that where, and that is all over the world, struck in Mexico, which was then a colony of New Spain. It traveled all through China, and as legal tender, even in the United States up until 1857, it could have been used in any number of transactions, as mundane as purchasing everyday items, but also perhaps in something like gambling. Ah, uh, very true. Our second item actually is intrinsically tied to gambling. Which will be this. So the what here is a six-sided colonial die made from bone. Mm. And it carries with it a unique engraved stamp that says GR with a crown on top of it. Absolutely. So here's the actual die. And I'll try to zoom in as far as I can on the mark. So here we have a die made from bone, which is why there's less glare on it. And it has this engraved stamp on it. Yeah. Now the GR stood for George Rex, King George, King George III. This was part of the 1765 Stamp Act. And to put that stamp on it meant that the appropriate tax had been paid. It was official. It was coming from Britain. So this would have been used primarily in 1765, but the Stamp Act didn't last very long. It was repealed in 1766. So afterwards, it probably wasn't used that long. It would have been used throughout the North American colonies of Great Britain, but probably not in the puritanical ones, which frowned upon gambling. You know, most people probably at least have heard briefly of the Stamp Act, but I thought that it had applied mostly to paper documents and things like that. Is that true? Well, yes, that's true. It was on all paper documents in the 13 colonies, your pamphlets, wills, newspapers, but also playing cards, and also they threw in dice. Right. So gambling, I believe, was already controlled. I think Queen Anne in 1710 had seen or taken a big concern with large gambling debts and had canceled most of them and then put controls on smaller gambling. So I'm pretty sure there was already an act, and maybe the Stamp Act just increased the duties on cards and dice? Yeah, I believe so, because we see after 1763 a broader pattern of Britain tightening control in the colonies and taking a more active uh, role in their governing. And that, that would have been part of it. Right. And I don't think the colonists were very happy with that, right? Um, they weren't, but it, it was a complicated situation. What, didn't Ben Franklin have something to say about this as well, if I remember? Yes. Ben Franklin, uh, one of the first global Americans, one of the first travelers to Europe, actually lived in Britain at the time. He supported the Stamp Act initially, but soon he, he came to see how angry the colonists were at it and opposed it vehemently. Whereas the British thought the colonies should pay more for their own defense and upkeep, Franklin pointed out all the American lives and money that went into fighting the French and Indian War with, that had just ended this whole cry of taxation without representation would go out, and that was part of it, wasn't it? They felt like the colonists felt they were not, they had no say. They were just being told they had to pay this tax. Uh, that's absolutely true. With the reinforcement of British authority after 1763, they stopped listening to colonial legislatures. So colonists naturally felt that they weren't being listened to. But the British point of view was the doctrine of virtual representation. 
to be a citizen of the British Empire anywhere, you were you were represented by Parliament, even if you didn't directly elect them. Britain had a very costly victory in what you could either call the French and Indian War, that's what they called it in the colonies, mm -hmm. or the Seven Years' War, which actually broke out in Europe a little bit later. They had a very hard start, but by the end of it, they had a, a strong victory. They kicked France out of Canada. They, so they increased the, the dominions of the British Empire exponentially, but it cost a lot of money. Well, the tax on uh, the dice, on a pair of dice, we only have one of the die here as an example, but on a pair of dice, the 1765 Stamp Act said that you had to pay 10 shillings as a fee. That's correct, and we think that's roughly $55 today or so? That's the best estimate that I've seen, although it's really hard to understand exactly how much True. you could True. purchase <laughs> with that material. By 1765, it looks like, yeah, it was somewhere around $50, $55, which is quite a bit of money when you think about right. it, just to use a pair of dice. So maybe tavern owners, if they were going to have some gambling, might buy into that and pay it back by getting the money from the gambling. Absolutely. Now, this coin, uh, an eight rail, would trade at uh, four shillings and sixpence. So roughly half of the fee that you would have to pay to use dice. That makes it worth, I mean, roughly it could buy $30 worth of material. It is quite a bit of money. And there's an estimate I've heard that a common laborer or a sailor or something around this time might have earned around four rails for a day. And this is an eight rail coin. So it represents about two days pay. So that's pretty substantial when you think about it, even if you had minimum wage today. Absolutely. And it reminds me of what a particular colonial reenactor told me one time, dressed up in full garb with a tricorn hat. And he was explaining the history of the Spanish mill dollar to me. And he said, now just imagine you walk into a tavern, take the coin, slam it down on the table. Just mm -hmm. imagine the noise and the reaction from everybody else. Right. It's as if to say, I've got money, look at me. It, it could be. It might be something, well, we know what this coin would sound like. Well, that's kind of a thud. <laughs> Depends <laughs> on what kind of wood of the yeah. table you've got. But it almost sounds like, I'm buying around for everyone or something. Yes, I don't know. if only. <laughs> so it kind of leads us up to our other questions. I want to get back into the thoughts of the artifactualist. And my next one for this coin is the how. So how was it made? And that's a really interesting story because coins have gone through a lot of technological advancements in making them more quickly. You need a lot to circulate. Of course, you need the raw materials, and Spain was mining a heck of a lot of silver, unfortunately, on the backs of the local people, really. They were forcing them to mine silver. Then they were striking it, and this one in particular, so on the back of the coin, uh, in up here where we see the 8R, that's because it's 8 reals, and then there's an M with an O on the top of it. That is the mint mark from Mexico City, which was the first mint in the New World established um, around 1535, so quite early. Wow. At that time, they would strike just a lump of metal, kind of measure out this heated metal to be about the right weight, and then they would hammer strike it, and it would come out as kind of a blob, what they call a cob coin. It's not a perfect circle. It's just been smashed. Now, there are a number of problems with that, especially because the silver in it is what was giving it value. So some people would scrape the edges, for instance, and cut off a little bit of that value and then circulate the thing that's a lesser weight and you've got to know you can trust your coins and if you can't then that's a problem. And in 1732 or thereabouts they introduced the screw press to Mexico City. Now this uses a flywheel, a very large screw on the top that spins to get the energy to press the ram down and make the dies which are the engraved images to strike into the coin. Now that means that they're using prefabricated blanks. So they roll out the silver. It's actually a, a silver alloy, 90.3% silver. As of 1772, that's where they settled in. And then they would stamp out these perfect circles, then place it into the screw press and strike it that way. But another thing that they did to avoid that kind of issue that I was talking about where people would scrape 
the sides was that they would impress a design on the edge. So the edge here looks like a kind of chain. I will do another close-up here to show that. It's kind of hard to see with this camera, but you can see that that would definitely deter you from cutting off the edge because once that's gone, people wouldn't trust the coin anymore. So why would I accept it as a merchant if that had been cut down? It's also what people call uh, a piece of eight. Ah, uh, yes, I remember that from reading Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, of course, and probably Muppet Treasure Island as well. <laughs> yes, these were the things that kind of made that phrase more popular, I think. And I can see why you would call it a piece of eight. It's eight reals in Spain. Most people think that it's called a piece of eight because it was cut into eight pieces to make change. That's kind of true, but not really. I mean, not, it's not all that common, especially not with an eight real. Uh, these milled dollars, these milled eight reals, are very substantial coins. So it's 39 millimeters across, 27 grams, and it is pretty thick. In order to cut that, you really need special tools. It can happen. It did happen occasionally. But usually with thinner coins, the earlier ones, or smaller coins. In fact, Spain issued not just the eight real, but a four real, a two real, a one real, and a half real. So, so why not use a two real coin? instead of cutting this into quarters, which is more difficult, and people wouldn't trust it as much. How do I know that's an exact quarter of that thing? I would have to weigh it to make sure that it's the exact weight. I no longer have the protection of the milled edge except on one portion of it. So coinage really depends on trust. And that brings us to another thing. Why these chop marks are in there is because they wanted to test to make sure that this was truly uh, an official coin you can see how they cut down through the surface. The, there's that circle with a dot in it. There are some of these that are actually Chinese characters. They're struck down in it so you can look beneath because people were also counterfeiting these by coating a base metal coin with a thin layer of silver. And if you cut through that, you might see bright copper shining through or something like that. So that's why you would cut down in there. It didn't really affect the value of the coin because you don't take out much weight when you do that. But you can test to make sure you're getting a real one. And some of the merchants would put a specific symbol in there and they might accept that same coin again because they've seen, oh my symbol's on there. I trust this coin because I've tested it before. I love how this object ties into an earlier form of globalization. I think that's just fascinating. It does, yeah. And pretty much anybody could have used it in China or in the American colonies, well, to 1787, they were circulating much earlier than that in the colonies. So I think they could use it for a whole lot of things. And Spain itself, I mean, Charles III was the king during the American Revolution, right? That's right. Uh, the United States had three major allies during the revolution. Of course, everybody remembers France, but also the Dutch Republic and the Kingdom of Spain. And Spain played a also a pivotal role in financing and, in some cases, like in Florida, fighting against the British in combat. So we've covered most of the questions now, I think. A bit of the how, right? It's made of bone, cut out of a, of a very large bone, presumably. And Yes, and I imagine that's a labor-intensive process because you have to cut the bone and then you have to smooth it out. Right, you've got to grind it down somehow because it is smooth. You can see uh, a bit of the well, I don't know if they're flaws, it's just the material. You can also see the paint that's in the pips that are cut, right. cut in. Right. They're drilled partly in, just like uh, a six-sided die today. Uh, in fact, the opposite sides of a die will add to seven. There's a one and a six on the other side, four Absolutely. and three. So this is exactly like what we would see today. Uh, but it's made of bone, and it has George III stamp on it. We also, um, we touched a bit on the who. You had suggested it would be profitable for tavern owners, and I, I completely agree. I'm sure individual gamblers would have used it as well, although it would have been pr quite pricey. The image that stays in my mind, though, is a bunch of people gathered around a table in a colonial tavern. Right. With a, a candlelit game of, of whatever it was they chose to play. Well, presumably, this, well, this one may have been made in Britain with that stamp, but for use in the colonies of America. Right. And they must have made quite a few, but the Stamp Act didn't last all that long. 
No, it was so unpopular. It was repealed in early 1766. We see it today as one of the many marks on the road to the American Revolution. And I want to be clear when we go through this, things, historical events tend not to be inevitable. There were many points from, say, 1763 to 1775 where both the government of Britain and the American colonists could have de-escalated the situation. There are always alternatives in history. It didn't have to turn out in a violent manner. Well, the American Revolution is kind of what we're leading up to, and although the coin comes from after that, we've made the point that coins like this were circulating before, and in fact, when the U.S. decided to make their own coins, the silver dollar, they used the Spanish milled dollar, the eight real coin, as the basis. One other thing that I wanted to show was a two real coin, and I did mention that these things exist. We were just talking about the American Revolution. Here's Charles III in 1775, so just oh, wow. before the right. American Revolution, and this coin may very well have been used in the United States. The back very similar, and it shows two reals. It has the ME stamp, which I believe is Lima in Peru. So it's a very thin coin, you see, and it doesn't right. have that edge protection. So these are the kinds of coins that you will often find actually cut to make small change. There was a tavern in western Pennsylvania that was excavated, and they found small coins that had dropped out of people's pockets or something, and these are usually the ones that you don't worry so much about to go looking for found a lot of half pennies and things like this from Britain because Britain had told the colonies that they could not strike their own coins. This is a sovereign right, and if you do that, you're starting to show too much independence. But they also didn't really send much in the way of coinage right. to the colonies. They had their own problems, a shortage of specie in their own uh, country. So American colonies tended to attempt to make things like paper currencies. There were a certain number of uh, paper monies attempted most people don't trust the paper money, especially at this time, and they're usually used as IOUs to try and fund warfare. This happened with the American Revolution, too. They issued the Continental Dollar, which was not terribly successful and not paid back after the war. I hear it wasn't worth a Continental. Well, that, that was a phrase that, that was, was actually saying, in use right? for quite some time, one that we don't hear so much anymore. But I have heard from some old-timers, my father, for instance, would call a quarter two bits. Yeah, I'm also told they can buy a shave and a haircut. <laughs> two bits. Well, they were there talking about two bits being two reals. It's a quarter of an eight real. And the expression definitely comes from the eight real. However, were they really cut or was it just a smaller coin? In this tavern that they excavated, they did find a cut two real coin into a quarter. So it's actually a half of a real in value. And I find that interesting because now we're getting down to the everyday person that might use coins. It would have been fairly uncommon maybe to have the whole eight real coin, but these smaller bits, yeah, they're going to use them in taverns and things like that, and they might use the dice there too. We've looked at a whole lot of things about these two items. They've given us great insights into something that led up to and was just after the revolution that created a new country. So, Brad, um, you promised us today we would be walking down history lane and I think it's fascinating that we've gone all up and down the 13 colonies all the way to what we now know as Lima, Peru. And China. We know this coin went Absolutely. all the way into China. So, yeah, our lane has been extensive indeed. We've traveled a long way. And that is ex what we're trying to bring out, the fact that these things have amazing stories and histories. There's so much more we could say about just these two objects, really. Absolutely. But I think that's about all the time we have for today. I'm Brad Hafford. And I'm Tom Pedrick. Join us again on another episode of Artifactually Speaking. Until then. <laughs>